inform you that the panel session is going to start right after the last presentation of the day. So that's also a kind reminder uh, for sharing your questions with us. And let me introduce first uh, speaker of uh, this session, uh, which is Darren Kendo, Dr. Darren Kendo from University of Virginia, Canada. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please let me know if you can't see uh, my screen but uh, you should be able to. Um, so again, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak about a huge passion of mine. Um, again, thank you to the organizing committee. It's been an outstanding conference uh, um, so far. Um, so it's my pleasure to talk about one of our papers that was in the special uh, edition of Nutrients, uh, Current Evidence and Possible Future Applications of Creatine Supplementation uh, for Older Adults. And Abby did a really good job, an excellent presentation, and Kylie as well earlier this morning, highlighting some of the, the multifactorial ap applications of creatine. But I'm going to sort of focus a little bit on older adults and preface this with a little bit of information towards uh, what we hope to achieve is healthy and successful aging. Um, for those who want to follow me on Instagram, uh, please feel free uh, to do so. So we'll start with some uh, negative connotations when it comes to aging. I think most of us that are watching, we can identify with this. Uh, when we're younger, just say the age is the 20 to 30, uh, we have very strong, uh, bigger, faster types of skeletal muscle. And then around the fourth decade, we start to see a biological process occurring um, a lot of people will be familiar with this called sarcopenia or the age-related loss in muscle strength, uh, muscle mass, and functionality. But you can see here muscle atrophy uh, will occur, and then there's good correlation that a decrease in, in muscle mass uh, is associated with a decrease in, in strength. That's all fine and good, but we now know that that decreases functionality or the ability to live longer uh, free of disease. So when you look in the mirror, this is some of the things that are occurring. From a cellular perspective, when we look at MRI and CT scans, it gives a greater picture. Uh, you can now see in a younger muscle, and again, we'll use that under the age of 30, uh, the femur here, and this is a cross-sectional area of the upper lower limb, it's extremely strong and rigid. To, to break your femur at a younger age uh, usually takes a traumatic event, uh, but you can see here around the femur, this very precious yellow, and, and this is what we're all trying to achieve. This is skeletal muscle, and of course, as we now know, and we've known for almost centuries that the main driving force for achieving uh, optimal skeletal muscle mass and, and growth is resistance training. Uh, and the leanest individual uh, uh, watching today will obviously have some subcutaneous fat. Keep in mind, there's really important intramuscular fat uh, marbling uh, the type of skeletal muscle, and that's often used for energy uh, during aerobic type of events. But over time, after the age of 40, and then this accelerates past the age of 50 into uh, uh, upper older age, we can now see that bone mineral density and content goes down. We'll allude to this called osteopenia and osteoporosis. And sadly, as just as well as decreasing bone loss, it's our precious skeletal muscle that seems to decrease. Now, as a highlight here, this is primarily due to inactivity. Uh, there is a biological process with aging, but if individuals can maintain physical activity every day or very often during the week and primarily weight bearing exercise or resistance type training, that can help, help resemble a healthy young muscle even later on into life. And there's really good evidence to suggest that a lifelong um, adaptation of exercise can actually help maintain the structure and integrity of the muscle almost up to the age of 100. So that is extremely motivating and, and beneficial. And if that's one of the big take homes from my presentation, please note that exercise will always be the foundation 
uh, of youth. Um, but sadly, as we get older, you see an increase in subcutaneous fat that will infiltrate around our organs into visceral fat. And that's led to something called sarcopenic obesity. It's in other words, where we're decreasing the size of the muscle and having a subsequent increase in fat accumulation. And now there's good evidence that this sarcopenic obesity has been linked to several chronic diseases such as type two diabetes and caxia, which I'll get to a little bit later. We'll focus specifically on osteoporosis or the age-related loss in bone mineral and strength. So the World Health Organization and a lot of uh, governing bodies have sort of changed their idea uh, regarding osteoporosis. Uh, the bone mineral content and matrix is very, very important. But as we get older, this lattice effect becomes more porous. It's a lot easier to fall, fracture, and break a bone. And this can lead to functional uh, um, limitations and functional dependence on informal caregivers, long-term rehabilitation and consequences. So unfortunately, these are consequences of musculoskeletal aging. We will all experience a successive loss of muscle, uh, bone and an increase in, in body fat. So to take all these potential negatives, if you will, what are some potential therapies that we're uh, here to learn about and to basically get an increase in healthy and successful aging? Well, why is this important? Well, after the fourth decade, and I will preface this, there is evidence uh, suggesting that this starts in the fourth decade and potentially even the late thirties, depending on activity level, but bus, bu uh, muscle and bone mass will decrease on average by about 1% per year. So again, you wanna try to build up as much bone and muscle tissue uh, at a younger age, including adolescents and children, uh, so therefore, when this biological process occurs, you're going to have more to start with. And therefore, you might not um, have these negative consequences of aging until later on in life. More specifically, these age-related reductions decrease muscle density and bone geometry. This is a fancy term meaning bone strength. And I highlighted and italicized these because in one of the papers, which we're going to talk about, we did see some potential beneficial effects on creatine on muscle density and bone geometry. Please note, these are two main areas that are implicated in the greater prevalence, if you will, of falls or fractures. So if we can increase muscle density and increase bone geometry, could this have a therapeutic effect if an individual does fall? maybe they will not suffer a, a fracture. With 33% of older adults, 50 years of age and older, uh, do suffer a fall each year. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Canada where we get harsh winters and a lot of snow and ice. Uh, so the rate of falls and fractures is a lot higher. Uh, but again, the health consequences of immobilization, forced physical inactivity are very detrimental. And of course, falls lead to physical inactivity. There is some push now that extended physical inactivity can lead to a plethora of diseases. So again, trying to maintain activity as much as you can is crucial. So again, some just reasons for knowledge translation or importance. Well, I think everybody that's watching would agree that maybe we'll never find all the beneficial effects of resistance training in a pill, but I definitely would agree that resistance training is medicine and preventative medicine. If the body is stronger, more functional, has a greater aptitude for neuromuscular activation and recruitment, there's a greater chance that this will improve musculoskeletal aging. And for example, if this individual would fall, the greater muscle tissue around the ankle, the greater bone density around the ankle could have massive implications for withstanding the sheer forces of falling or performing activities of daily living. And I'm very glad to see a lot of older individuals are engaging in resistance type training, uh, which is often overlooked. Uh, and again, I'm very happy that some position stamp papers are really trying to promote uh, resistance training. And this includes TheraBands, um, any type of weight training or resistance type of exercise you can do around the house. Anything that will overload or cause mechanical stimuli to your muscle uh, is beneficial. So again, resistance training is the driving force for musculoskeletal adaptations. So if we piggyback off after the beneficial effects of resistance training, we've sort of come across uh, another avenue, if you will, of creatine monohydrate supplementation. 
as the researchers have talked about ever since Roger Harris's and Eric Holtman's uh, seminal studies in 1992, it was sort of looked at as a athlete or an exercising individual type of, of supplement. And since creatine was discovered in the late 1800s, a plethora of research has followed looking at the effects now on aging musculoskeletal biology. Can creatine and resistance training potentially increase muscle mass, strength, could that have beneficial effects for bone cognition, as Abby just talked about? And Dr. Ralston will go into elaborate uh, details later on. But is creatine the anti-aging supplement? Well, we'll go through some preliminary evidence to suggest that potentially it should be considered um, with your resistance training program. And then another question that gets brought up, what if the individual has comorbidities to exercise? What if they can't exercise? is creatine by itself, sort of like a multivitamin, beneficial to take? So it's already been talked about yesterday and briefly uh, this morning, I wanted to touch on dosing strategies because when we get to the aging body, we do start to see a different effect. Um, for those watching and, and listening, you're probably familiar with aging anabolic resistant, and, and that's where the aging body is resistant, primarily the two things, resistance training, and dietary protein. So the, the protein researchers have now recommended that dietary protein intake needs to go up in older adults because they need to get a higher amount per serving to get the same uh, relative uh, benefits compared to younger individuals. And maybe the dose or volume of resistance training needs to go up as well. Well, accumulating research primarily in my lab in, in collaboration with some of the, of the scientists I've been very fortunate to work with we're starting to see that maybe a higher dose of creatine than even what's been generally recommended may have an overall um, beneficial effect. So we'll start with the well-known, very valid uh, loading phase. This is extremely effective. It, it results in rapid accumulation of intramuscular um, and brain content creatine stores. So most of us would be familiar with the 20 grams a day. This is usually taken uh, four or five gram dosages per day, or you could do 0 0.3 grams per kilogram. This idea about relative dosing goes back to Adam Persky's elegant study and review article, which you should all read in 2003, where the larger the individual, they may have more creatine transporters and transporter activity. So a larger individual may require more creatine on a daily basis compared to someone who's smaller, and that could have some applications for the relative dose. But once you saturate the muscle, and this has been shown quite elegantly in, in Roger Harris's 1992 paper and, and subsequently in other studies, you can decrease the dosage down to three to five grams per day. That would probably be about one to two servings of red meat or seafood a day. That's probably not achievable for most individuals, primarily vegetarians, uh, vegans, and if you're emphasizing a plant-based diet. So a lot of people will choose dietary supplementation. In our lab, we do, based on this relative dosing, keeping sex equated, males and females, uh, we like to do 0 0.1 gram per kilogram a day. Uh, so if you go on the scale, you're 70 kilograms, that individual is taking seven grams a day. If you're 100 kilograms, it's 10. We can give this in one dose or multiple doses up to the preference of the individual. And then, of course, Eric Holtman's uh, uh, a seminal study uh, in 1996 showed that three grams a day, this is probably the lowest dose we see, two to three grams. If you take this for average health benefits every day, that'll eventually accumulate in your muscle. Um, we're not really sure how much this will uh, do for brain or, or bone. So this is primarily for muscle as it stands now. Uh, this will give you some beneficial effects. Um, but we're starting to see an accumulation of evidence that maybe higher dosages might be more beneficial uh, in older adults. So I just want to touch on and summarize some of the, the data. There's been about four and potentially five meta-analysis uh, on creatine and resistance training in older adults. And I want to highlight the most comprehensive uh, meta-analysis. This was led by Dr. Uh, Phil Chilibeck. Uh, Phil was my mentor, uh, Dr. Scott Forbes' mentor. Uh, Phil is actually one of the world's best creatine researchers. Um, so uh, take uh, a lot of pride with that. He's probably forgot more than I'll ever know on creatine. And I'm still very fortunate to collaborate with Phil on a regular basis. Um, but this study or meta-analysis look at 21 studies. We combine all the individual uh, case studies. So the nice thing with a meta-analysis, it gets your statistical power up. 
And that's a huge limitation when we're looking at nutritional intervention studies. Uh, over 700 males and females. Uh, so again, the age was 50 and above. They had to be randomized to creatine monohydrate or placebo and perform resistance training. And this was the typical uh, two to three days a week, all the way up to the 52 weeks and a variety of measures looked at measures in body composition and strength. And these results echo all the previous meta-analysis in older adults, but when you combine all the individual studies, getting that statistical power and confidence up and looking at different weights from each study, when you combine resistance training and creatine monohydrate supplementation, the older individuals got a greater 1.3 kilogram increase in, in muscle mass. That may not sound like a lot, but for those individuals that are having a decrease from a biological process in muscle mass, uh, this is a normally uh, beneficial and it approaches clinical uh, significance. So in other words, if an older individual would just perform resistance training, they will get an increase in lean tissue. But if they wanna get a greater increase, uh, the, the collectivity of uh, data is showing that creatine will increase uh, muscle mass. We went even further here in a lot of these studies looked at creatine and other ingredients such as whey protein, uh, CLA. And when each of those individual studies was taken out, creatine still was superior. In other words, creatine is one of the driving forces in combination with weight training to cause an increase in skeletal muscle mass. So this can have massive implications for individuals predisposed to sarcopenia, caxia, things like that, which we'll talk about. Probably more importantly, even the sarcopenic guidelines now lists uh, muscle strength as more important than muscle mass because that leads to health outcome measures and functionality. When you look at all the data, upper body strength, and this was primarily measured with the chest press, uh, creatine was superior to placebo. So this could have applications for improving activities of daily living, which emphasize upper body strength. And potentially more importantly, is that creatine in combination with resistance training superiorly increase lower body strength. And why is this more important? Well, since the largest muscles atrophy quicker in the lower body, this could allow an individual to maintain activities of daily living, climbing stairs, so on and so forth. So therefore, this is really important. Muscle mass has gone up from a total body perspective. And again, whole body muscle strength seems to go up a little bit more uh, when we look at meta-analysis of creatine and uh, resistance training. But a question often gets brought up, could the differences in older adults be based on fossil creatine kinetics? And there's a debate in the literature, and we published a couple papers in the last few years but when you look at all the data that have specifically looked at changes or age-related changes in fossil creatine kinetics, when you look at all studies that combine all muscle groups in the lower limbs, there's actually no difference in fossil creatine metabolism. In other words, young and older muscle seems to have a similar response and um, sort of uh, content, if you will, when it comes to creatine. Now, these studies looked at uh, muscles below the knee. So looking at the gastrox and soleus, but they also looked at muscles above the knee, the big powerful vastus lateralis or the quadricep. So when all studies were combined, looking at all three, we did not see any differences in phosphocreatine kinetics. However, we went a little bit more isolated. And I think this is massively important, especially for those who miss leg day. When we looked at the studies that solely focus on the vastus lateralis or the big quadricep muscles, the ones that are used in high intensity activities, such as weightlifting, running, sprinting, or high intensity interval training, the young muscles had more of a favorable effect. In other words, the fossil creatine content in older muscle was reduced. So these powerful muscles, which maintain activities of daily living or high intensity sports was more reduced compared to younger muscle. Now you could argue maybe older adults don't perform weight training or high intensity exercise. Maybe they eat less red meat. Maybe they have a, a greater uh, muscle atrophy of type two muscle fibers in the vastus lateralis. All of those are very plausible and realistic. What we hope that this brings out is that since this muscle is more 
negative, if you will, regarding falsocreatine. This may help explain why we really see beneficial effects on measures of leg press and lower body strength in older adults. In other words, since they're more negative, we think the, this type of muscle responds more favorably to supplementation. So one of the things you'll notice is that older adults seem to respond very favorably to not only whole body strength, but more specifically lower body strength. And we think because they have reduced fossil creatine stores, they will respond more to creatine supplementation. So two take homes for older adults that you're working with or watching, please never miss leg day. You can focus at a higher volume because we want to maintain overall adaptations uh, with that over time. So how does it work? I don't want to bore you into too much detail, but of course, one of the questions uh, that often gets asked and uh, is that it just leads to water retention. And interesting, Abby just did a really elegant presentation uh, before me talking about some new data on extracellular and intracellular uh, work. But the magic of creatine, we think, starts with the cell swelling. And so if creatine, where it's osmotic, can allow more fluid to be driving into the cell and creatine getting into the muscle cell, it seems to unlock a cascade of magic, if you will, or uh, multifactorial events. So it increases a number of muscle anabolic processes. We now know that it can increase the expression of insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor is made in muscle in the liver, but it's also highly involved in bone adaptation. And there's good evidence that if you increase insulin-like growth factor expression, it will stimulate these transcription factors. Darren Willoughby has done an excellent job highlighting those as well. So if you increase IGF, the subsequent step here is you increase transcription factors, which are sort of like little spark plugs for satellite cell activation. Satellite cells re reside between your sarcolem and the basement membrane, and they migrate to areas of inflammation and metabolic stress. So for example, post-resistance training, these satellite cells are migrating to damaged areas of the muscle fiber to donate their nuclei to hopefully get an increase in transcription. And if you go back to high school biology, you remember transcription is basically DNA sending information to messenger RNA to send different information out into the cytosol to get an increase in protein translation. So the theory here is that creatine does not directly increase muscle hypertrophy. I can't stress that enough. There's never been a study where creatine has increased the rates of myofibular protein synthesis directly. Uh, so it's different than protein, but it seems to have this step-by-step -step process elaborating many things where it can get an increase in hypertrophy. There's also evidence that creatine can increase some of the protein kinases in the mTOR pathway. So there's an anabolic potential, and then just as important, it's the anti-catabolic or ways to preserve the environment of your muscle. There's good evidence at the whole body level that creatine can decrease protein breakdown. There can decrease oxidative stress and inflammation, allowing the muscle environment to recover. So it's not an anti-inflammatory, but it does have anti-inflammatory processes. So it's interesting, I would argue creatine has muscle anabolic processes, and it also has muscle anti-catabolic processes. So in my humble opinion, it's the most effective uh, supplement when it comes to the muscle environment uh, that a, an individual can consider. So in summary, overall, creatine greater than three grams a day, maybe a bit higher, five grams seems to be the average uh, amount considered, and resistance training can increase uh, measures of muscle mass and performance. Now, in the absence of resistance training, which seems to unlock and, and stimulate all these potentials, there's a small body of literature, and we're just preparing another uh, article right now for review, but it seems that in the, uh, the studies that had no resistance training intervention, if you do experience a benefit, the creatine loading phase was necessary. So again, this is interesting. If you wanna take creatine without resistance training and you wanna get some benefits from an aging perspective, a higher dose may uh, be required. Um, and the effects of creatine with and without training in diagnosed sarcopenic adults with a specific criteria or in adults with creatine uh, synthesis deficiencies is relatively unknown. The totality of research in, in older adults is primarily focused on healthy individuals 
we're starting to get more clinical interest in disease state or people with sarcopenia. Just because you're older uh, does not necessarily mean you're diagnosed or have sarcopenic traits. So this leads me to the, the surprise, if you will, in our lab when it comes to bone health. Uh, for those who use dual energy X-ray optometry or DEXA scans, you'll know usually we're looking at increases in lean tissue mass and potentially fat, but it also will give you some indication of bone mineral content and, and density. And if we look at our basic bone remodeling process, this is occurring 24 hours a day. We're having our osteoclasts send signals based on hormonal regulation to basically uh, leak calcium from our, our bones, the increased amounts of calcium in the bloodstream. And that of course subsequently sends signals to our osteoblasts or bone building cells to increase bone matrix. And this is occurring over time. Surprising, about a decade ago, when creatine was incubated with osteoblast cells, they actually started to improve the bone remodeling process. So this led to some possible justification. What if a population who was susceptible to bone loss, osteoporosis and penia, if they consume creatine, could this remodeling process occur faster and maybe get an increase in bone density? Well, Abby alluded to this study a little bit earlier on, so I won't spend a lot of uh, time, but we performed a clinical trial um, over a decade ago, and we focused primarily on postmenopausal females, and they had to be postmenopausal for one year. And this was published again with Dr. Phil Schulebeck in, in Medicine and Science in, in Sports and Exercise. So we took uh, postmenopausal females over the age of 50, and they were randomized to creatine monohydrate. Again, we used the relative dosage, 0.1 gram per kilogram. It was about nine grams per day or placebo. And they performed 52 weeks or a full year of supervised resistance training. This was done three times a week for 52 weeks. And as Abby already talked about, um, sadly, from an aging perspective, none of the group means were above zero. In other words, even an entire year of resistance training, Older females still saw a 3.9% decrease in bone mineral density loss at the hip. And this has massive clinical applications for more, mortality and uh, functionality. But we were very happy that creatine preserved or attenuated the rate of loss. In other words, females on creatine only decreased bone mineral density loss by 1.2%. Females, unfortunately, uh, decreased by almost 4%. This is clinically significant, whereas a 5% loss in bone mineral density leads to a 25% greater increase in fracture risk. So again, maybe one year was not long enough. Maybe we need to do a subsequently longer uh, trials. The other argument is DEXA only measures aerial bone mineral density loss. So if you were to hold up a pen, we're actually only measuring the outer shell. We need to have more sophisticated technology to go inside the bone to really find out what's happening. But again, this was providing some preliminary evidence that females on creatine would suffer less bone mineral density loss. And this is clinically significant because fracture of the hip is one of the main causes of functional impairment. Here in Canada, a small country, we spend almost $700 million on rehabilitation and medical diagnosis uh, in um, hip replacement. If you would extrapolate that to the United States, we'd be approaching probably about five or six billion a year just on uh, something that could be prevented. So we did a little bit uh, more invasive uh, uh, technology and used to look at what's happening when we get on the area and density of bone. And this was probably one of my most proud uh, publications because we sort of use elaborate technology. Uh, this was published last year in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. And we sort of piggybacked and highlighted more of the effect. It was a clinical trial again, uh, 53 participants, 50 years of age, and we used males and females. Uh, that again, they used one year of supervised resistance training and the creatine dosage uh, was the same. And unlike DEXA, we went in and used some elaborate uh, imaging technology, so 3D uh, capabilities with PQCT. Uh, so again, this provides a 3D image of not only bone mineral density and area, uh, provides bone strength, uh, muscle density, and muscle area as well, so obviously a little bit more elaborate. And over one year, the creatine group 
experienced a significant increase in lower leg muscle density uh, compared to a slight decrease in placebo. Now, if you can remember back to one of my initial slides, lower leg muscle density is highly correlated with decreasing the risk of falls and, and fracture. And again, using this elaborate technology, now looking at the distal tibia, so again, the areas implicated in falls and fractures, uh, the creatine group had a significant increase over time with relatively no change for placebo. So this has some clinical applications for density. And then we get to the tibial shaft area, the total area, uh, hardly any change in uh, the creatine group, but a significant decrease uh, over time. So again, we're now having a piggyback of DEXA with some 3D imaging, starting to see some small, but yet really important aspects in the lower uh, part of the body for older adults. Again, right around here are the muscles attaching for falls and fractures. So could this be implicated in falls prevention? Um, there's only been one study that has looked at uh, the incidence or rate of falls and, and fractures and, and Dr. Guglielmo will be on after Dr. Ross and talking about their single study. And, and there was no difference um, they did not use resistant training in their design. Um, I will say that we have a two-year study with resistance training and creatine in the works. Dr. Chilbeck is uh, eagerly working on that paper. It started in 2013 and it actually ended in 2018. But as we all know, we get really busy. Uh, there's some really interesting results that I don't want to share yet, um, but uh, stay tuned for those. Hopefully we can get those out uh, this year. So in summary, um, those two studies that I just talked about were the beneficial effects, but the majority of, of studies on creatine and bone actually don't show a lot of efficacy. Uh, some of the studies did not include a resistance training program or the dose was too low. Of the studies showing a positive effect, and there's only a few, all incorporated supervised resistance training and the dose, and so here's a little bit different, all used at least eight grams a day. So the recommendations of two to three to five are all based on muscle. Um, now we're starting to see maybe bone tissue requires a little bit more, but again, dosing studies uh, need to be performed. Uh, again, unlike muscle, creatine alone has no greater beneficial effect on aging bone uh, as it currently stands. Uh, and the effects of creatine on risk and instance of falls is relatively unknown. So these are the areas uh, we're really looking at future RCTs. So this led to something from our papers with collaborations uh, with Dr. Scott Forbes and individuals in Australia. Well, we've already talked about muscle and potentially bone, but the whole idea of what if an individual has both? What if they have aging muscle loss and low bone density called osteosarcopenia? Uh, there's no RCTs that have ever looked at individuals specifically with this over time. So that's a future uh, grant that I'm actually uh, looking to prepare to our Canadian Institutes of Health research is very similar to your NIH in the United States. Um, so we're looking at osteosarcopenic individuals. Can creatine and resistance training have some favorable effects? And frailty, a lot of individuals are diagnosed with frailty highlighted by muscle weakness, uh, slowness. Uh, so can creatine based on its high energy phosphate uh, kinetics have some beneficial effect? And again, the overall is we don't wanna see this ever can exercise and maybe a nutritional intervention. And of course the focus potentially is on creatine. Can this have some massive implications? What about the effects of creatine on bed rest? Institutionalization, these are areas that we need a lot more uh, research with that. And finally, caxia. Uh, we may be very familiar with forced weight loss. This is usually implicated with cancer, HIV, uh, chronic kidney disease and or cardiovascular disease but you can see rapid accelerated muscle loss, fat accumulation and bone loss in individuals with what I would consider, consider inflammatory or catabolic uh, conditions, which could lead to catastrophic effects on muscle skeletal biology. Since exercise and creatine can have some beneficial effects, can this improve the overall functionality? Um, so again, we're working with individuals with caxia, post uh, and during cancer uh, recovery, can that have some beneficial effects as well. So in summary, I wanna highlight uh, Dr. Scott Forbes and individuals in uh, Australia who helped put this uh, paper together. We now know creatine and resistance training can have some beneficial effects on sarcopenia and bone. 
we've alluded to the potential of creatine increasing high energy uh, kinetics. Could that uh, have some implications for sarcopenic obesity? But the overall totality is we're trying to really decrease uh, frailty and, and disease. I want to thank the organizers and everybody uh, listening. I was uh, very humbled to be here. Uh, hopefully this provided some information. Uh, for those who have specific questions, please email me or if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, uh, please do so as well. Uh, thank you and hopefully enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.